Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to CarrieLutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro-trainings on financial survival. Fourteen ninety WGCH. This is Kerry Lutz. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network. Do you think that things are coming apart at the seams? Does the international monetary system look like some type of Rube Goldberg device? Well, then my next guest, Jason Hamlin of GoldStockBull.com, has got some things that you need to hear. Jason, welcome back to the Financial Survival Network. Thanks for having me, Kerry. Great you came back. Good. Just about everybody does come back at some point or another. We're looking at uh, a breakout in gold and silver again, and it's about two and a half, three weeks since the last breakout, right? That's right. I just published an article yesterday on uh, how I think silver is likely to double um, by the end of the year. I think this is another one of those opportunities where people are kind of uh, sentiments turning negative. And people are losing faith in the precious metals market. And that's typically right about the time when it uh, skyrockets higher and leaves uh, leaves people wondering what happened. You think it's a capitulation of that? Um, I don't know if we're there quite yet, but I think um, we've had quite a bit of quantitative easing going on over the past several months, even if it's been in a more stealth format. Um, we see the ECB pretty much following in the footsteps of the Fed uh, with their long-term refinancing operations. And so much money is being pumped into the system that it was only a matter of time before gold and silver get going again. Um, I don't rule out the possibility of one more uh, sharp decline before it gets going, but I fully expect both gold and silver to make new highs by the end of the year. Yeah, it's like so many people expect that. I mean, I do too. Uh, you know, of course I do. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it. But when everybody's singing the same tune, it always gives you a little pause for thought. You know, I had a uh, listener out there, I think her name was Jamie, and says, I got about 2,500 ounces of silver, got some extra money, and I, I feel like I should start to playing the euro dollar. My feeling is like these currency plays are really for pros, especially when she was talking about doing it through an ETF. Uh, what's your thought on that with the flux, the constant flux that we find the international currency system in. Yeah, well, I mean, they're just fiat currencies rising and falling against each other. So I don't get caught up too much in what they do uh, versus each other. Ultimately, I wouldn't want to be holding any of the fiat currencies when the day of reckoning finally comes. Um, and, you know, that's another way to view gold and silver. It's not really the price that it's going to, but it's it's the value that it holds. It's the purchasing power that you preserve or increase um, by holding real money as opposed to these fiat currencies that you're mentioning. Uh, John Williams, uh, Shadow Stats, just put out a couple of days ago, I believe, some new price projections based on his uh, SGS alternative method of inflation. And he came out with 88.90 gold and 517 for silver. If you kind of smooth out or take away some of the government gimmicking that makes inflation look not quite as high as it really is. So uh, when a lot of people talk about an end to this bull market or it's in a bubble or time to get out, I, you know, I always refer back to that in terms of the inflation adjusted high and we're nowhere close to the inflation adjusted high from 1980. And I expect it to be taken out uh, rather easily because the conditions that drove prices that high in 1980 are much worse today than they were then. Yeah, no question. And if gold gets up to 88.90, when my wife isn't watching one day, man, there goes her wedding ring, the engagement <laughs> ring, and her entire jewelry box is getting melted down. But uh, not to be sold to cash for gold, I'm going to have it melted down into ingots and say, you know, hon, your ring, it's down in the safe. Don't worry about it. It's worth so much money. You just shouldn't be wearing it anymore. You know, I'm looking out for your benefit here. <laughs> right. Not not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. Hey, and that uh, set of sterling that uh, has been passed down through 10 generations, that's in the safe too, because I don't remember the average set of sterling, how many ounces of silver are in it. I think it's a few hundred. And if you have serving pieces, a lot of them, it's even more. 
think about that. What you just said, four or five hundred bucks an ounce, that means that your set of sterling that your great grandmother passed down to you is worth almost a hundred grand. Can you imagine this, Jason? Right. Yeah. A lot of people talk about precious metals uh, preserving purchasing power. I actually view them as a way to significantly increase your purchasing power over time. I mean, they're going up a lot faster than uh, currencies are going down. And at some point, I don't know if I would uh, melt it down, but I, I definitely look to trade in when there's mania. And as a cycles investor, I think real estate is going to be the next place to switch your assets. So at some point, I'll be looking to sell out of gold and silver at least a significant portion of my holdings and move into real estate, which I think will continue falling over the next few years. Yeah, that is a great point of uh, when it's right to get out. A lot of uh, a lot of you've heard from people on the show that when the Dow to gold ratio gets down to three to one, two to one or one to one, that's when you got to be thinking of getting out. The problem with that one is that right now with the inflation, it's inflating the stock markets. And what that presumes is that the stock markets will crash even though the liquidity is being poured in there. I'm not convinced of that. It sounds reasonable because that's the way it's happened in the past. But I agree with you that real estate, especially multifamily housing, whenever we have this uh, existential event for the dollar, that's going to be the place to put the money. I totally agree. Cash flow, you know, when properties are trading at a 20% uh, cash on cash return, meaning that if you have a million dollars in there, you make 200000 a year, that's when the money's going into real estate. And we're talking the real money, which is whatever purchasing power is left having been transferred to gold, right? And so right. Yeah. Any income producing property, whether it's uh, rentals, multifamily, like you suggested, or even uh, uh, like a farm agriculture, if you're producing food, uh, read a pretty interesting study about letting uh, inflation destroy your debt, in essence. So if you take out a long-term fixed rate loan from a bank, you know, at three or 4% now in order to buy income generating real estate over time, you're able to charge more and more for rent as inflation goes up or get more and more from your crops as the food prices go up, but your payments stay fixed. So you're essentially letting the uh, inflation destroy your debt. And that's where the bulk of the uh, gain can come from. I know a lot of people say get out of debt uh, in time like this and I can certainly understand that train of thought but I think there are instances where debt can be taken on in a strategic manner uh, in order to increase your wealth yeah that is uh, if you ever listen to Robert Kiyosaki of rich dad poor dad fame what he says is there's good debt and there's bad debt good debt enables you to buy an asset which produces a cash flow for which hopefully you will not be personally liable for that will pay your debt service and provide you a a return that uh, you could not get without the debt. Bad debt is when you go into Walmart and you wave the credit card and you buy a flat screen TV with money that you don't have and then you're paying 20% interest on a $2,000 debt. It's costing you $200 Twenty percent of two thousand four hundred dollars for the first year, and you pay it down over eight years, and that flat screen wound up costing you six thousand bucks. That is bad debt. That's what you need to keep away from. Good debt is being is debt that you can adequately service, and that you can uh, pay down and allow inflation to destroy over time because inflation favors debtors. It hurts savers. And one other thing about that real quick, um, that means that if you're going to rent a house or buy a house, rental might appear to make more sense. But if we're going to have this major inflation, your debt will be inflated away. And that's something that you need to think about, right? 
Right. And I don't see how we can get away from uh, major inflation. We may have some deflationary pressure in the short term, but uh, I think the central banks are going to meet it with such strong amounts of liquidity and money printing um, that there's no chance of seeing it last. I think it'll be a pretty quick shift from a deflationary environment to an inflationary environment, particularly in cash based markets and you know, credit markets may suffer longer. It may continue to be uh, difficult to get a loan on a, on a home or anything that requires a large amount of, of credit. Um, but I think the problem, and I don't hear a lot of economists or analysts talking about this too much, but getting to the root of the problem is, is interest on money. I mean, this is the root of the problem of the, the, the debt issues that Europe is facing. The U.S. just went over 100 uh, percent debt to GDP ratio or even on an individual level. Level, you know, the debt that's destroying families because they can't get out of it. All of these things are really um, symptoms of the bigger problem, and that is that we're allowing banks <laughs> to create money out of thin air and then charge interest on it. And of course, if that's not absurd enough, you know, on its own, the money to pay back the interest does not exist. It's not in existence. So it's this system that's set up, I think, deliberately in order to transfer wealth and power to a small group of bankers. Because if I take out a loan for $100,000 and say over the course of five or 10 years, I owe back 150 or 200,000 on that loan, where does that extra 50 or $100,000 come from? You know, it's not in the money supply. There's other money out there, but every other single dollar was also created out of debt and interest is also owed back on that money. So technically it's impossible to ever pay these debts back. And all that's happening is uh, the people are scrambling more and more desperately to try to find money to service their debt, you know, to avoid bankruptcy. And the same thing's happening with corporations. The same thing's happening with sovereign nations now. And sitting at the top of the pyramid is a small group of people that have the privilege to be able to print this money essentially out of thin air or the people that get it at the lowest interest rates first and can lend it back out into the population at higher interest rates. So we have this system that when you step back and look at it is entirely unsustainable and it, and it just kind of blows my mind that we allowed this to exist. And everybody talks about yeah, gold and silver is great. You can protect your wealth, protect against inflation. Um, but we have this larger systemic problem that's not going to be solved until we all come to terms with how flawed our economic model is. And we either need to change it or what I think is more likely to happen is it's going to, to break down, kind of implode under the weight of its own corruption. And, you know, at that point, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to usher in something better. But uh, I think all of these discussions have to get back to the fact that we have this monetary system that demands uh, infinite growth, you know, in a world of finite resources. And so it just it, it doesn't make any sense at all. We need we need a significant shift if we're able to get back on track as a country and really as a world. Yeah, as a world and as the country who's leading the world into the abyss. When I went to school, right, and I'm a little hesitant to say when, but in 1977, right, I learned uh, I was an economics major first, then a banking major, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't remember. I had so many majors that by the time I hit the end of college, I didn't have enough credits in any particular area to graduate, which actually I think was a great thing because then I was looking through the ca catalog and general business, which I said, oh, that's great because you don't really major in anything, but you, all your credits work for something and you can get that degree. But having been an economics major until uh, the university that I went to, I realized all the economics professors were communists and not very nice people either. I learned that money gets created out of thin air, inflation occurs. That was when I learned about the Austrian economics that the economics department at Pace University, who now has an incredible guy there, um, I can't remember his name, Salerno or something like that. Um, that was when I learned that money gets created out of thin air, that uh, Rothbard said all banks are bankrupt. That's why the Federal Reserve was created to bail them out in the first place, and that the system them inevitably would collapse. And actually, all of this was taught to me earlier by my grandfather, Abe Fader, who was also known as Honest Abe, when he said, when you got to pay interest on interest, 
you got a real problem and that's where the world's at now we're paying interest on interest and that cannot last for long can it it can't and uh, i think you know a key to changing this is really awareness and i think the ron paul campaign uh peter schiff and others have really been bringing attention to the absurdity of the monetary system so as more and more people start to understand exactly what's going on i ha i hold out some hope um that there can be some change and you know i also have some hope in the occupy movement i know a lot of my colleagues kind of dismiss it out of hand as you know it's certainly as big as it is there's going to be some people there that uh you know are fans of lenin or che Guevara or whoever else but i think by and large you know they do have legitimate demands they do understand what's going on they understand the fed is a private bank they understand that our politicians are no longer accountable right they're not representing the people anymore they're representing whoever gives them the most money and there's plenty of examples of this you know with the bank bailout as one uh, the majority of the people were against that and yet what did they do they turned around and pushed it through with the rack in afghanistan again the majority of the population were against these wars and wanted out a long time ago we kind of got out of iraq recently we're still in afghanistan um so you know our policies are are no longer we no longer have a representative democracy you know there's this corporatism or fascism Oh, yeah. Um, so the system's completely broken, whether it's political or economic. And I think as more and more people start to, to understand this, um, we do have a chance at hopeful, hopefully implementing something better in the near future, like in our lifetimes that we can actually witness and hopefully participate in affecting change. Well, from your mouth to God's keyboard, Jason, but my feeling is uh, I kind of take the attitude that uh, towards economic reform that uh, Dr. Johnson took towards uh, second marriages, the triumph of hope over experience. And if you want to hear some of those Occupy people and their economic knowledge, I've got a uh, an interview in there from the Spokane uh, Silver Summit, uh, Occupying Spokane. It's in my archive someplace on kerrylutz.com. It's hmm. worth a listen to because it's really enlightening. One out of four people really understood what was going on. So, uh, Jason, we got to wrap up. Uh, if you're looking to find, uh, to find you on the Internet, where do we find you? My website is goldstockbull.com. It's G-O-L-D-S-T-O-C-K-B-U-L-L.com. I offer a lot of free information on there. And then I also have a premium membership, which is my newsletter uh, portfolio view. And then I've recently put together a bunch of guides, uh, premium member guides. I'm trying to move the website uh, away from just being about stock picks and making money, more about uh, preparing for what I believe is this crisis that's about to happen, how you can transition through it effectively, and then just a discussion about new ideas and new solutions for how we might, if we have a chance to reshape things, you know, once the dust settles, what can we learn from, you know, the past hundred years and how could we do it better? Yeah. And along those lines, book I'm uh, reading right now, James Rickard's uh, Currency War is, is spot on and gives a great historical context for exactly what's happening now. Jason, great to have you back again, and we'll be checking in with you in a few weeks. We'll put you on the regular rotation and have a prosperous week ahead. Thanks a lot. You too, Gary.